and suddenly above the teeming crowd, pushing forward like a river driven by an unseen power, a girl appears. She descends lightly from the train, hops onto the gravel, looks around inquiringly, as if somewhat surprised. Her soft blonde hair has fallen on her shoulders in a torrent. She throws it back impatiently. With a natural gesture, she runs her hands down her blouse, casually straightens her skirt. She stands like this for an instant, gazing at the crowd, then turns and with a gliding look, examines our faces, as though searching for someone. Unknowingly, I continue to stare at her until our eyes meet. Listen, tell me, where are, you, where are they taking us? I look at her without saying a word. Here, standing before me, is a girl. A girl with enchanting blonde hair, with beautiful breasts, wearing a little cotton blouse. A girl with a wise, mature look in her eyes. Here she stands, gazing straight into my face, waiting. And over there is the gas chamber. Communal death, disgusting and ugly. And over in the other direction is the concentration camp. The shaved head. The heavy Soviet trousers and sweltering heat. The sickening, stale odor of dirty, damp female bodies. The animal hunger. The inhuman labor. And later, the same gas chamber. Only an even more hideous, more terrible death. Why did she bring it? I think to myself, noticing a lovely gold watch on her delicate wrist. They'll take it away from her anyway. Listen, tell me, she repeats. I remain silent. Her lips tighten. I know, she says with a shade of proud contempt in her voice, tossing her head. She walks off resolutely in the direction of the trucks. Someone tries to stop her. She boldly pushes him aside and runs up the steps. In the distance, I can only catch a glimpse of her blonde hair flying in the breeze. I go back inside the train. I carry out dead infants. I unload luggage. I touch corpses, but I cannot overcome the mounting, uncontrollable terror. I try to escape from the corpses, but they are everywhere, lined up on the gravel, on the cement edge of the ramp, inside the cattle cars. Babies, hideous naked women, men twisted by convulsions. I run off as far as I can go, but immediately a whip slashes across my back. Out of the corner of my eye, I see an SS man swearing profusely. I stagger forward and run, lose myself in the Canada group. Now at last, I can once more rest against the stack of rails. The sun is leaned low over the horizon and illuminates the ramp with a reddish glow. The shadows of the trees have become elongated, ghost-like. In the silence that settles over nature at this time of day, the human cries seem to rise all the way to the sky. Only from this distance does one have a full view of the inferno on the teeming ramp. I see a pair of human beings who have fallen to the ground, locked in a last desperate embrace. The man has dug his fingers into the woman's flesh and has caught her clothing with his teeth. She screams hysterically, swears, cries, until at last a large boot comes down over her throat and she is silent. They are pulled apart and dragged like cattle to the truck. I see four Canada men lugging a corpse, a huge swollen female corpse. Cursing, dripping wet from the strain, they kick out of their way some stray children who have been running all over the ramp, howling like dogs. The men pick them up by the collars, heads, arms, and toss them inside the trucks, on top of the heaps. The four men have trouble lifting the fat corpse onto the car. They call others for help, and all together they hoist up the mound of meat. Big, swollen, puffed-up corpses are being collected from all over the ramp. On top of them are piled the invalids, the smothered, the sick, the unconscious. The heap seeds, howls, groans. The driver starts the motor. The truck begins rolling. Halt, halt, an SS man yells after them. Stop, damn you. They are dragging to the truck an old man wearing tails and a band around his arm. His head knocks against the gravel and pavement. He moans and wails in an uninterrupted monotone. Ich will mit dem Herrn Kommandanten sprechen. I wish to speak with the Commandant. With senile stubbornness, he keeps repeating these words all the way. Thrown on the truck, trampled by others, choked, he still wails. Ich will mit dem. Look here, old man, a young SS man calls laughingly, jovially. In half an hour, you'll be talking with the top, top Commandant. Only don't forget to greet him with a Heil Hitler. Several other men are carrying a small girl with only one leg. They hold her by the arms and the one leg. Tears are running down her face and she whispers faintly, 
Sir, it hurts. It hurts. They throw her on the truck on top of the corpses. She will burn alive along with them. The evening has come cool and clear. The stars are out. We lie against the rails. It is incredibly quiet. Anemic bulbs hang from the top of the high lamp post. Beyond the circle of light stretches an impenetrable darkness. Just one step and a man could vanish forever. But the guards are watching, their automatics ready. Did you get the shoes? asks Henry. No. Why? My God, man, I am finished. Absolutely finished. So soon? After only two transports? Just look at me. I, since Christmas, at least a million people have passed through my hands. The worst of all are the transports from around Paris. One is always bumping into friends. And what do you say to them? That first they will have a bath and later we'll meet at the camp. What would you say? I do not answer. We drink coffee with vodka. Somebody opens a tin of cocoa and mixes it with sugar. We scoop it up by the handful. The cocoa sticks to our lips. Again coffee, again vodka. Henry, what are we waiting for? There will be another transport. I'm not going to unload it. I can't take any more. So it's got you down? Canada is nice, eh? Henry grins indulgently and disappears into the darkness. In a moment, he is back again. All right, just sit here quietly and don't let an SS man see you. I'll try to find you your shoes. Just leave me alone. Never mind the shoes. I want to sleep. It is very late. Another whistle, another transport. Freight cars emerge out of the darkness, pass under the lampposts, and again vanish in the night. The ramp is small, but the circle of lights is smaller. The unloading will have to be done gradually. Somewhere the trucks are growling. They back up against the steps, black, ghost-like. Their searchlights flash across the trees. Vasa, water, luft, air. The same all over again, like a late showing of the same film. A volley of shots, the train falls silent. Only this time a little girl pushes herself halfway through the small window and losing her balance falls onto the gravel. Stunned, she lies still for a moment then stands up and begins walking around in a circle, faster and faster, waving her rigid arms in the air, breathing loudly and spasmodically, whining in a faint voice. Her mind has given way in the inferno inside the train. The whining is hard on the nerves. An SS man approaches calmly. His heavy boot strikes between her shoulders. She falls. Holding her down with his foot, he draws his revolver, fires once, then again. She remains face down, kicking the gravel with her feet until she stiffens. They proceed to unseal the train. I am back on the ramp, standing by the doors. A warm, sickening smell gushes from inside. The mountain of people filling the car almost halfway up to the ceiling is motionless, horribly tangled, but still steaming. Auschlauden, unload, comes the command. An SS man steps out from the darkness. Across his chest hangs a portable searchlight. He throws a stream of light inside. Why are you standing about like sheep? Start unloading. His whip flies and falls across our backs. I seize a corp by, corpse by the hand. The fingers close tightly around mine. I pull back with a shriek and stagger away. My heart pounds, jumps up to my throat. I can no longer control the nausea. Hunched under the train, I begin to vomit. Then, like a drunk, I weave over to the stacks of rails. I lie against the cool, kind metal and dream about returning to the camp, about my bunk, on which there is no mattress, about sleep among comrades who are not going to the gas tonight. Suddenly I see the camp as a haven of peace. It is true, others may be dying, but one is somehow still alive. One has enough food, enough strength to work. The lights on the ramp flicker with a spectral glow. The wave of people, feverish, agitated, stupefied people flows on and on endlessly. They think that now we'll have a face to a, have to face a new life in the camp and they prepare themselves emotionally for the hard struggle ahead. They do not know that in just a few moments they will die, that the gold, money, and diamonds which they have so prudently hidden in their clothing and on their bodies are now useless to them. Experienced professionals will probe into every recess of their flesh will pull the gold from under the tongue and the diamonds from the uterus and the colon. They will rip out gold teeth. In tightly sealed crates, they will ship them to Berlin. 
The SS men's black figures move about, dignified, businesslike. The gentleman with the notebook puts down his final marks, rounds out the figures, 15,000. Many, very many trucks have been driven to the crematoria today. It is almost over. The dead are being cleared off the ramp and piled into the last truck. The Canada men weighed down under a load of bread, marmalade and sugar, and smelling of perfume and fresh linen line up to go. For several days, the entire camp will live off of this transport. For several days, the entire camp will talk about Sosnoviets Bangin. Sosnoviets Bangin was a good, rich transport. The stars are already beginning to pale as we walk back to the camp. The sky grows translucent and opens high above our heads. It is getting light. Great columns of smoke rise from the crematoria and merge up into a huge black river, which very slowly floats across the sky over Birkenau and disappears beyond the forest in the dire direction of Trizerbinia. The Sosnoviets bounding transport is already burning. We pass a heavily armed SS detachment on its way to change guard. The men march briskly in step, shoulder to shoulder, one mass, one will. Und morgen de ganze Welt, tomorrow the whole world shall, they sing at the top of their lungs. Rex, Ren, to the right, march, snaps a command from up front. We move out of their way.